Hello, and thanks for joining us for this deep dive discussion. My name is Ben Smith, and it's my honor to sit across the table from Pastor Sean Scarborough, lead pastor of Family Worship Center here in Lakeland, Florida. Our goals for these conversations is to dig deeper into the gospel of God as we unpack some key points from Pastor Sean's Sunday messages. We hope this will be a catalyst for discipleship in your life and hopefully lead to more conversations with your family, friends, and in your small group. Let's jump right into it. You started a new series yesterday yep. entitled Resilience. That's yep. a strong word of a title. Yeah, Resilience. sure. Resilience. Right. Can you walk us through the inspiration behind the title of this new series? Yeah, so what happened was we did a, um, a, a one-off on a Wednesday night on um, essentially what happens during the process of prayer and why we pray more and kind of brought in maybe the more spiritual component, conversations, angels, demons, all the above. And people's intrigue and curiosity just sort of let me know, oh, okay, this is something that we've not leaned into. And so what would, what would the purpose of spiritual warfare even be? And um, yeah, just the idea of being resilient in prayer, resilient through temptation, it seemed to be like that was a word that could be found in a lot of the the, I guess, topics that'll flow out of this series. So yeah, that's where it came from. Cool. Yep. So yesterday you went through the Lord's Prayer yep. and broke it down in a very practical way, relating it further to how we should pray and what God is looking to do in our lives as we submit fully to Him and His will. In yep. the conversation of give us this day our daily bread, yeah. you went into God's desire to bless us. Matthew chapter 7, verse 11 says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Yep. So in Christianity, we can oftentimes have this poverty mentality sure. where we think we shouldn't have as much as a part of suffering for the gospel, yep. if you will. The question is, is there ever a moment where God will withhold what we are in need of as a means to draw us deeper into prayer and pursuit of Him or to increase faith? Or is it that we are lacking in what we are in need of because we aren't fully submitted and committed to prayer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Um, I, don't I don't know. Um, so let me say it like this. We definitely see in Deuteronomy where he said that... Um, I withheld so that you would know what your parents didn't know, that man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So there does seem to be a withholding, but not to a point of, because then we turn around the Psalms, and the psalmist says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging for bread. So there seems to be a tension between... Um, not having everything that I want, but also having everything that I need. And I think that's where when Paul, so if we're going to kind of just from a prosperity perspective, Paul to Timothy, when he came in and he said, if you have food, if you have clothing, if you have shelter, with these things be content. And I guess for me, that's sort of the balance. It doesn't seem like God would ever withhold those things. The essentials. The essentials. Mm -hmm. Because... We're never going to be begging for bread, and we should always be content with the essentials. However, we are told to ask for more than the essentials. So do I think that God would withhold the more um, until we would be ready for it or demonstrate a posture to seek first the kingdom rather than the things? Absolutely. I, I do think that. But I would not apply that to starvation, no. Yeah. You brought up yesterday uh, when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, yep. and uh, manna would come from heaven, and yep. there was the command, only get what you need for this day. Yeah. And there was the temptation to collect more because sure. they were unsure. That's, that's pretty daunting yep. because it, it really instills a reliance on God yep. and not on material possessions and wealth. Yep. And I think the same is for us today. We can get really comfortable, and you brought this up, we can really get comfortable in what we have and what we know is going to be there versus realizing and believing that God put it there for us to have. Yeah. Um, and so I like the word that you use, tension, because that creates, at least in me, it creates the reality that I, I need to stay humble and thankful before God for every plate of food for sure. that is put on the table for every snack. Because it's easy to forget. Absolutely. It's easy to, um, well, I get a paycheck yeah. every week. 
my wife gets a paycheck every week. We know that's going to roll in. Yeah. And it's easy to build a reliance on that and not on God yeah. and not thank God for the paycheck or for the job yeah. or whatever. Um, so that's, that's good. So there are essentially two timelines happening. The <laughs> yeah. one where God has sovereignly said these things will happen. Yeah. Jesus came to the earth incarnate. Jesus will return as far as the clouds, rapture the saints, and so on. Like these things are going to happen, period. Then there's a timeline where God allows participation in things happen where he allows those things happen relative to our submission to him. Yeah. Maybe the thing, maybe the timing of a spouse, a job promotion, yeah. whatever it is. So we witness the craziness of our world, the chaos, seemingly the evil prospering, uh, the righteous suffering at times. In this conversation, I can't help but think of a question that comes up all the time, and I'm sure you hear it too, is God in control? Yeah. Um, God is in control. Well, let's say it like this. God is sovereign over everything. Mm -hmm. He can take control of anything at any time. Um, is he doing that over everything all the time? No. We don't, he didn't do that in the Garden of Eden. He didn't take control of Eve's choice or Adam's choice. Um, he didn't take control of Cain when he chose to kill Abel. Um, so is he controlling things no, he's not controlling evil things. He's not causing evil to happen. Is he in control in the sense that God is overall? Yes. And so that's where I think at a practical level, I hesitate to say, no, God's not in control. But at a practical level, God is not taking control. That, so that, That's saying two entirely different things. It is. Um, it, it, it absolutely is. So there, there is that delineation there. It, it, God is sovereign. Yep. He can step in at any time that he wanted to. Yep. Um, for me, it's comforting to know that he can do that. For sure. And that he will do that. Yep. If God is not in control, so to speak, yep. then it's, it's daunting for me to even submit a prayer. Yep. Because it's like, well, can he help me? Can, yep. Does he have the power to do this? But yeah, I mean, absolutely. He does not. He's not controlling. He does not control. Yeah. He doesn't always step in. But as a believer, it is comforting for me to know that he can and that he will yeah. as I submit myself to him in prayer. Yeah. yeah. To me, that's saying two different things. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That helps. So you talked yesterday about discerning the spirits, stepping outside of what's happening in the flesh, forgiving the person. And recognizing the spirit, the motive behind the words and the actions. Yeah. We read in Matthew chapter 16 how Jesus rebukes Satan in a remark that was made by Peter. And I'm sure Peter was distraught. Like he just, yeah, he just called me Satan. Yes. Because we see that throughout, you know, yeah. throughout the gospels where the, the disciples, it's taken them a minute to catch up. Yeah. Because full revelation had not come yet. So they're they're like, what did he mean by that? What yeah. is happening? So I'm sure Peter in his mind is like, he just called me Satan. Like, yeah. what was that about? <laughs> yes. But Jesus was discerning the spirit behind Peter's remark, and which Peter tried to make with good intentions. He didn't want to see his friend, his Savior, go to the cross and suffer. Um, so my question is, can an evil spirit work through or motivate a believer? Oh, sure. Uh, absolutely. How does, yeah. can, can you dive into how that happens? Yeah, and Be we'll get into that. Like, okay, in, but, in the coming but, Yeah, okay. but to okay. say, I mean, it, it, the question is relevant. Um, we absolutely can be motivated by the flesh or by the spirit. Like the flesh and the spirit are at war at all times. Um, the flesh is, can be controlled either by our own desires, but like James tells us, our own desires tempt us, and then they come to the point of sin. Well, when we're talking about sin, we're talking about evil, right? And so there is, um, can an evil spirit motivate envy? Absolutely. Can an evil spirit motivate jealousy? Absolutely. So if I am, if I see someone has, if they have something that I don't have, and then I become envious, I mean, we're told that where jealousy and envy are, there is every evil work. So absolutely, a, a spirit of jealousy or a spirit of envy can act upon me and not, not possess or control in the sense that if I'm an unbeliever and they take residence in my heart, that's different than the Spirit of God has sealed me. So I, I'm not controlled by an evil spirit, but absolutely influenced by an evil spirit. Absolutely. And we see that with, with Peter. Right. It, it's interesting to think, and that was going to be my next question, in terms of it's not possible for an evil spirit to dwell in a believer, yep. but it is possible for them to externally motivate absolutely. a believer to where the believer will submit to yep. that influence and yep. motivation and then act upon. Yep. 
um, that's hard for my mind to wrap around, which I believe that's true, but it's hard for my mind to wrap around because those thoughts are processed internally. Absolutely. And they come out externally. Yeah. But the motivation yeah. is external. Yeah, Even that, though the dwelling, there's no dwelling internally. 100%. And that's where we're going to have to kind of take a, a deep dive into what is soul, what is spirit, in regards to the, the mind, or in my mind, that's a, that's a phrase we would use. Um, it, it seems like that is where the influence happens. So a battle going on in my mind is different than a battle going on in my spirit. It's, it's just different. And so us kind of understanding what that is and what that means. Um, I think in a good way, I would sort of compare it to this. We, every believer, has been filled, sealed with the Holy Spirit. So we have God within us. But then there are those moments that the Spirit of God comes upon us, right? Like that's a, a separate, a different act. And I think that is where bad comparison, but we can be filled with the Spirit, sealed by the Spirit, and we can also have a spirit who is evil actually come upon us or, I mean, yeah, come upon us to, to influence us to do something we should not do. And that's where we have to battle. Jesus talked about this lady. He was referring to healing, not something else. But he said, why would this lady who, uh, Abraham's daughter, who's been bound by Satan these 18 years, right? So there was something, she was a good person, and yet she was being oppressed by the enemy. So there does seem to be that relationship that really begs the, the question, or at least the, the participation in spiritual warfare. I think that's why it's called spiritual warfare. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you've talked about this before, um, the difference between possession of an evil spirit and the oppression of yep. an evil spirit, which, you know, as believers, we, we, will, we do experience in life the oppression of evil yep. spirits that try to come. And, and yep. obviously we've been called in participation to prayer yep. uh, in relation to those things. Um, so you brought up several things yesterday that contribute to the chaos of our society. A yep. Muslim senator saying, God bless America. Yep. Up to 70% of Christians believing that there are other ways to have him besides Jesus, which I didn't know that. I, I can't that's, believe that's a that's, number. I, you know, like I, I said it in church. I'm like, I can't imagine this number's right, but you that's said the that. one that's you out said there. That. You said that. You <laughs> did. You questioned the validity of that number. Um, but it was it was a study that was produced. For so sure. Yeah. How valid, we don't know, yeah. but it was a study that was produced. Yeah. Um, and then the fact that pastors are rolling down and piling up at the bottom of the, bottom of the hill in moral <laughs> sure. failure. Yes. So spiritual warfare is happening. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. We as Christians have, have hope. We always have hope. Absolutely. As we near the coming of Jesus. Yep. My question is, is there hope on this side of heaven for things to improve? Or, I hear this a lot, especially in Pentecostal circles, or will they can just continue to get worse as we near the coming of Jesus? Yeah, I think it's both. I, I believe that we can have greater peace and joy in our homes as we follow Jesus. The gospel always works. So if we have promises, the, the if then, like when we were talking earlier, um, if we do these things, um, God will do the things he has promised. Do I think the world is going to get better because there are going to be far more people being saved? That's the part. I don't think the world's going to get better. I think the world is going to continue to slide into chaos. I think that's what we see prophetically even in Thessalonians, when we, we see the, those uh, predictions about the end of days in regards to um, there's going to be a great deluge, um, a great delusion is, is the phrase that is used, um, that will attack the minds of people, and they will just, at that point, um, they have said no to Jesus. They will continue to say no to Jesus. There's a great falling away that is predicted. I think that's what we're seeing right now. Um, where the number that 70% is not right from my perspective is because the ones that say that aren't Christians. So if we like, if we took and really controlled and said, no, we're talking about people who they're in the house of God, they're Without serving, the they're living for Jesus, their families that like, uh, who are they? Take that number of evangelical Christians and tell me how many of them say he's have not be, the only have way. To be zero. It's zero. Yeah. So everybody else, we're just cultural. They're just cultural Christians, yeah. which is that a Christian? I would say no. So the the data isn't wrong. It's the category is what's wrong. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so do I think it's going to get better? No, I don't think it's going to get better. Okay. Not even temporarily. No. Okay. Because we have seen that historically, where 
society, like even not not on a world scale, but yep. maybe maybe on a national or even a state yep. level where things have gotten really bad, and yep. then we we come back up a little bit. Sure. Maybe there's a little bit more peace. I don't know, but at this point, you you don't think there's a a breath of fresh air. You think no, okay, no. Like you know, you go back as far as 1905, 08, somewhere in there. The the amount of Christians per population ceased to increase from there to now. So we haven't seen. So when you were, you know, it was 17 percent of the population, 20 percent, 25, 28, 30, 32, 35, 35, 34. 35, 33, 34. Like, it's not, it's just sitting there. Yeah. So from that number, obviously for it to be staying the same and population to be increasing, people are coming and falling off at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. You brought up the if-then statements. Yeah. There's that one that says, if my people who are called by my name. Is that yeah. Chronicles? Is that, is it, I think that's what um, it is. It, no, this I think is, it was one of the prophets, right? Okay. I don't remember, but the, if my if my people are called by my yeah. name will humble themselves, seek, pray, yep. uh, then I will hear them and I will hear yep. their land. Uh, paraphrasing there. Yep. I've seen a lot of Christians relate that to America. For sure. So that was spoken to the children of Israel. Yep. But is it a principle that could be applied to Absolutely. any nation? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. I, and I've seen, honestly, I've seen... I think you can apply it to a family. I th- yeah. I think... It, a, a the principle is there. Absolutely. I've seen a lot of yep. discussion on social media about this. People will post that. Yep. Um, we're in a we're in a political season, election yep. coming up, and so I've seen people post that scripture, and I've seen other people post a scripture and say this isn't for us. Yep. It, it was for the children of Israel. Yeah. And bringing into light, we have to understand the historical context, and so I've seen people debating over yeah. that. Yeah. But I agree. I, I think. I, I don't jump into those debates on social media, but I think the principle is there. Like if you humble yourself before God, He hears you. Absolutely, and He'll yep. He'll act upon your behalf. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm one of those. I'm a very positive. Like when I say I don't think it's going to get better, um, I try to say that in a positive way, not yeah. a doom way. Like I don't think the world's getting better, but that doesn't speak anything of the church. Yeah. Um, you know, the world could be sliding into chaos around Israel to the point of the text that you were just bringing up. Um, the world could be sliding into chaos. That didn't mean that was going to happen in Israel. And we see that even, it's fascinating, when you looked at the judgment of God upon Egypt when they had enslaved Israel, and when there would even be natural disasters, hail or whatever, it wouldn't affect the children of Israel's crops or the children of Israel's livestock. And so um, when it's judgment, I mean, God can be pretty surgical. Yeah. He's not judging his people. He has authority over the, the uh, natural absolutely. elements of the world. Absolutely. Uh, over the spiritual forces yeah. as well, but over the natural yeah. elements. Yeah. yeah. So you've opened up this conversation of spiritual warfare yeah. yesterday. I'm excited to see in the coming weeks um, where this series will take us. Yeah. Uh, because uh, I know that there are a lot of questions that are arising. And in the next couple of weeks as we get ready to do another podcast. I'm sure more questions will arise and it'll start a lot of conversations. So I'm really excited about it. But what's one thing in the midst of spiritual warfare, praying, seeking Jesus, witnessing the chaos that we are experiencing? Yeah. What would you encourage the church with? If it was a sentence, if it was a, if it was a phrase or a paragraph, something simple, what would you encourage the church? Yeah. I, I think we have to be aware that there is a battle and we have to want to engage in it. Uh, this is not a time for ignorance to be bliss, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's easy to become guilty of that to where we're blinded to the spirit, going back to forgiving people, the yeah. spirit behind what's happening physically Yeah. Um, to where we're just dealing in the physical, yeah. not realizing that there's spiritual warfare happening, that there's evil spirits at work and that God is at work yeah. on our behalf. And so the prayer for our eyes to be open. That we may see, yep. and you brought this up a couple of weeks ago in a message. Elijah prayed for his ser- uh, or excuse yeah. me, Elisha yeah. prayed for his servant that his eyes would be open in yeah. the midst of them being surrounded by a physical army. Yeah. And in the moment of his eyes being open, he saw a spiritual army, absolutely an ar- army yeah. of angels and chariots of fire that was surrounding. Yeah. And so um, I'm right along with you. I'm going to be praying as well that our eyes would be open, our ears would be tuned in to what God is doing and what's happening, the spirit at work behind what's happening in our physical world. Yeah. 
because that's where that's where the battle's taking place. Yeah, absolutely. Is spiritually. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So that's all we have for this for this morning for this Great. podcast. Uh, again, you've opened up this conversation, so I'm excited to see where it takes us. Uh, but anything you you want to add as we close out today? No, I think the only other thing from yesterday that we didn't really touch too much on was really just, um, you know, in regards to uh, aware of the, the difference between God and Satan. I mean, Satan is not the equal and opposite of God, right? Like he is a, he's a principality, a power that we've been given authority over. When we understand that, um, it's not quite as scary going into the battle as it might otherwise be. Um, but if we don't recognize his schemes, we don't engage. He's already so, a defeated foe. For sure. Yeah, Jesus gave us authority over him. Yeah. Yep. That's encouraging. Absolutely. That's good. Yep. All right. We want to thank you for joining us again for another deep dive discussion. Uh, we hope this encouraged you. Uh, share this video with someone that you feel needs encouraging. And we hope to see you this Sunday. And we'll see you next time uh, for the Deep Dive Podcast.